Is there such a thing as a typical serial killer? And if there is, how would you describe their M.O.? When you picture it in your mind, how you think a serial killer usually operates, you might think of a person who stalks his prey in the dead of night and lures unsuspecting victims into his car or home before brutally slaughtering them. You might justifiably believe they're someone who is highly intelligent and goes to great lengths to cover up their crimes, and for years they manage to outsmart the police at every turn. And as for their victims? Well, you're possibly thinking they're likely to be beautiful young women who have a very specific set of features, like the same hair color or clothing or race, something that appeals uniquely to their particular killer. What you're unlikely to be imagining is a man who raped and killed elderly women in their own homes, rarely going further than a couple of miles from his own residence, and far from covering up his crimes. Today's monster left his victims exactly where he had attacked them, making no attempt to hide what he had done. There were no ritualistic displays, no posing of the bodies, and nothing to indicate a serial killer was involved. Today's monster was extensively incarcerated for other violent crimes, and yet he managed to elude suspicion in rapes and murders for more than 15 years, all while carrying out his attacks right under the nose of the police. Was it the fact that he got tips and tricks from Ted Bundy, or did he just get lucky? This is Monsters. Adolph James Rhodes was born in Fort Lauderdale, Florida on the 4th of December 1960 as the third child to his doting parents. As a smiley, calm baby, he was affectionately known as Little Jimmy to friends and family. In the months before his birth, America was facing a reckoning of sorts as protesters took to the streets to expose racial injustice. While Jimmy's mother adored him when he arrived, she was also somewhat preoccupied as she watched the events unfold on the news programs which were playing religiously in the family home. The nation seemed split down the middle by the increasing political divide, not too dissimilar from now. At that time, citizens were expected to take sides either for or against the ongoing segregation of people of color. Not long after Martin Luther King gave his famous speech where he told demonstrators in Washington, D.C., I have a dream, Jimmy's mother abruptly moved out of the family home to run away with her African-American lover, leaving her children solely in the care of their father. It was a shock for the relatively conservative family, especially Jimmy's father, who had no inclination of his wife's extramarital activities. Two years later, the couple were officially divorced and Jimmy's father moved his new girlfriend Brenda into the home. She soon became a maternal figure for the three children, offering them the love and support they no longer received from their birth mother. Most of history's serial killers focus heavily on a disturbed and disruptive childhood filled with abuse, neglect, and violence, which shapes the child into a manipulative and psychopathic murderer. But Jimmy's story reveals nothing of the sort. In fact, apart from his mother leaving in his early years, Jimmy had a relatively normal and stable upbringing from then onwards. His father was a carpenter who spent long hours at work to support his family while Brenda stayed home and raised the children. When the couple married after two years of courtship, they moved into a beautiful home complete with a swimming pool in a much better neighborhood than they had previously lived. Brenda's parents also owned a ranch, and the children regularly visited, riding ponies in the ring their step-grandfather built especially for them. By all accounts, there was no violence in the home, and the children were always supported in their interests by their father and stepmother. The children wanted for nothing, not attention, not love, not possessions. They had it all. When Jimmy started school when he was five years old, he appeared to have some learning difficulties and trouble paying attention, and Brenda suggested counseling to his father. But the idea was dismissed and Brenda dropped the issue instead of choosing to spend extra time with the boy to help him with his schooling. His father thought it could be beneficial for him to spend more time with Jimmy, so after receiving a number of lucrative promotions and being more financially stable, he was able to invest more hours into his relationship with his son. He began taking both of his two sons out to play golf, and he taught them how to hunt. 
Between work commitments, they went away regularly on fishing trips, leaving their sister and Brenda behind. Despite the additional attention, Jimmy's behavior at school was worsening. What had started out as difficulty paying attention and general disruptiveness had become all-out antisocial behavior by the time he was in middle school. He was regularly ejected from the lunchroom for stealing other kids' food, despite having no need of it for himself, and when he threatened a child with a knife, he was immediately expelled. By the time he reached high school and hit puberty, he had become a truant and a thief, stealing expensive objects from shops and causing fights. Before long, smoking cigarettes had turned into smoking pot, stealing soda became lifting beer, and he was breaking into neighbors' houses to raid their cupboards for alcohol and cash. Through it all, Brenda and his father attempted to set boundaries and understand what had happened to the once happy and chatty boy who was now dark, brooding, and downright deceitful. The parents began to fight more regularly as their differences in opinion over how to deal with Jimmy's behavior began to surface. They had tried stern warnings and groundings, but the punishments had little effect on Jimmy. By the time he was 12, Brenda had had enough of the wedge Jimmy had driven between her and her husband, and after 10 years of marriage, the couple separated. By then, Jimmy had graduated from pot to quaaludes, LSD, and cocaine, and he was on first-name terms with the local police who had returned him home numerous times after being caught shoplifting or causing a disturbance in the neighborhood. He was now in his mid-teens and his destructive behavior had become altogether devious. A report was filed with the police from a 70-year-old neighbor who lived not far from Jimmy's home. She described how in the dead of the night, she had been sleeping when she was awoke to find a man in her room masturbating. He had run off when she awoke. Police later discovered that her phone lines had been cut, her home had been looted, and there was urine in one of the rooms. Police suspected Jimmy might be involved given what they already knew about him, but given DNA wasn't a thing yet, there was no evidence tying him to the scene and he was never questioned. Not long after that event, another 70-year-old woman by the name of Alice was similarly disturbed when a young man she recognized from the neighborhood had broken into her home during the night and demanded she remove all of her clothing. When she told the man firmly that she would not do such a thing, he backed out of her house and disappeared into the night. When the police arrived, she named the intruder as Jimmy Rhodes. For this crime at age 15, Jimmy was arrested and later sentenced to two months and 11 days imprisonment. Less than four months after being released, he was questioned on suspicion of involvement in three similar burglaries in homes within a couple of blocks of where he lived, and all of the women were over the age of 70. Jimmy admitted to being behind them all. Despite the growing list of increasingly disturbing crimes, he was merely given a warning and told to stay out of trouble. By now, you've probably already guessed that he did quite the opposite. Five months later, he admitted involvement in 11 similar crimes against elderly women in his neighborhood, and yet he was charged with just one count of burglary on account of his confession. This time, he spent three years in the Florida State Penitentiary. In 1979, officers responded to calls from concerned neighbors who had been unable to make contact with their elderly neighbor. When they entered her home, officers found the woman dead in her bed, with a sheet draped over her naked body. She had been raped and violently murdered in her own home. Her autopsy confirmed that she had been strangled and sodomized. The woman's name was Alice, the very same Alice who had previously been attacked by Jimmy when he was just a teenager. Jimmy had been released from prison just two weeks before her murder. He was immediately brought in for questioning, but denied any involvement, instead claiming he was at the local pub during the time of Alice's attack. Despite the connection between Jimmy and Alice, there was no forensic evidence tying him to the scene and officers were forced to let him walk. In January of 1980, an 81-year-old woman was found beaten and stabbed in her home just a few miles from Jimmy's residence. Nothing had been stolen from her home, and it appeared she too had been sodomized. The investigation into her murder was intensive, but no leads emerged and the case soon went cold. No connection was made to Alice's murder despite the similarities. That same month, Jimmy visited his ex-stepmother Brenda, who lived just 10 miles from him under the guise of desperately needing to talk to someone. Jimmy's beloved older brother, Ricky, had recently died in a vehicle accident, and Brenda welcomed him into her home. 
After 15 minutes of talking, Jimmy abruptly lunged at Brenda and put her in a headlock from behind. He dragged her into the bedroom and raped her. As he carried out his attack, he whispered into her ear that it was something he had been dreaming about doing for years. Brenda fought with every ounce of strength that she had as Jimmy tried to strangle her to death, and eventually she was able to crawl away into the bathroom where she locked herself in and wedged her body between the door and the bathtub in order to stop Jimmy from being able to follow her. He finally left her home. In a state of shock and disbelief, Brenda called Jimmy's sister and told her what had happened. Instead of calling the police, the pair decided it was best if Brenda put the rape behind her and move on. Of course, why not? Meanwhile, Jimmy was in the crosshairs for yet another burglary. He was arrested and taken to county lockup, but his birth mother posted his bail and he was released. Just weeks after Brenda's rape, a 70-year-old woman was found half-conscious on her kitchen floor after being violently beaten during a nighttime attack. After being hospitalized for her injuries, the woman told police how a man had knocked on her door asking to borrow some sewing thread before turning angry and trying to choke her to death. When asked by officers if she had ever seen her assailant before, she quickly answered, quote, Of course I have. He's my grandson, Jimmy Road. Jimmy was arrested and charged with the attempted murder of his grandmother. During his trial, Jimmy's lawyer somehow managed to convince the jury that no grandson would be capable of carrying out such a brutal attack against his own blood. Evidently, he was a convincing guy and the jury found Jimmy not guilty. He was immediately released, but the burglary he had committed in between the rape of his stepmother and attempted murder of his grandmother was a violation of his parole from his previous imprisonment, and he was arrested almost as soon as he stepped out of the courtroom. The jury in his robbery trial was not so forgiving and they didn't believe Jimmy's proclamations of innocence. He was found guilty and sent back to prison for five years. It was during this incarceration that Jimmy's story takes the darkest turn. If you believe in coincidences, here's one for you. At the same prison where Jimmy was incarcerated, Ted Bundy was awaiting execution on death row. At the time, Ted Bundy had confessed to murdering 30 young women and girls, though it's believed he is guilty of many more. Jimmy became obsessed with the notorious killer, whose crimes were all over the news and in the papers. By now, Jimmy had already murdered at least one woman, and he had every intention of picking up where he left off once he was released. Maybe Ted could give him some tips. Jimmy began manufacturing opportunities for the two to meet. And so, as Jimmy walked through the cell block making deliveries or serving meals to the death row inmates, he would whisper to Ted through the doors of his cell. Sometimes Ted would slip Jimmy his newspaper, advising him to read the articles about his crimes thoroughly. It's believed that Ted gave Jimmy advice on how to kill women and hide the evidence, though Jimmy's M.O. is considered amateurish compared to Ted's. The long period of imprisonment, combined with Ted's encouragement, seemed to have an effect on Jimmy, and he attempted to rape a female guard just months before he was due to be released. For this crime, his prison sentence was extended by three years. With his prison sentence now stretching far into the future, Jimmy began to use those newspapers from Ted Bundy for another purpose. He began responding to advertisements posted in the personal section of the paper from women looking to find a love interest. Using a story he concocted about being from Italy, having an Ivy League education, and having served in the Italian Special Forces, Jimmy managed to seduce a woman named Kathy Lockhart, all from within the four walls of his cell. Jimmy wanted to make sure Kathy would wait for him, so he told another fabrication about being wrongfully imprisoned and that he was due to be released any day. After a few months, he told Kathy that he had changed his name to Caesar Baroni in memory of the Italian family who had raised him. This was, of course, a complete fabrication, but it satisfied Kathy's curiosity about his surprise name change. Somehow, when Jimmy was finally released, he had no parole conditions and no requirements that he should stay in a certain area. And so, unsurprisingly, he traveled to where Kathy lived and met her in person. That just so happened to be the Pacific Northwest, exactly where Ted Bundy had carried out many of his killings. Within months, Jimmy and Kathy made their relationship official and married before moving into Kathy's mother's home so they could save for their own place. 
After a couple of months, they had enough for a deposit and bought a quaint home just for the two of them. By then, Jimmy had made his name change official. Given the paper systems of the time, the new name meant an entirely new identity. Caesar Barone had no criminal history, no record of incarceration, and no debts. He was completely free and clear to do as he pleased. With his new identity, Jimmy enrolled in the United States Army using another concocted story of college degrees, a clean criminal record, and seemingly no reason why he couldn't enlist. He successfully completed his training and soon advanced to become a ranger, one of the most highly qualified soldiers in the army. Jimmy went on to serve in a deployment to Panama where he would later brag to associates that he killed several unarmed civilians. Jimmy gleefully carried out state-sanctioned killings, with his colleagues none the wiser that this was far from his first taste of such violence. When Jimmy returned from deployment, he settled back into his regular routine alongside Kathy. Well, she thought it was their regular routine, but the taste for violence abroad had not satiated Jimmy's desires and he was back to his old ways, right under his wife's nose. A woman in her 80s had reported to the police that a man had been showing up at her house and the visits had started to scare her. This man told her that he was a ranger out of Fort Lewis and that his wife worked at the same place Kathy was employed. His first visit to the elderly woman was innocent enough when he told the woman he was looking for his wife's lost poodle, and she helped him look for it, but he started coming by every day and forcefully requesting to enter her home. After she let the man in a few times, he had exposed himself to her and tried to grope her. She told him to leave, but he returned the next day and this time tried to army crawl towards her on the ground, running his hand up her leg. Finally, the woman had had enough, and she told her son about the man, and he helped her make a police report. Given the level of personal information the man had shared with the woman, investigators were fairly certain the creep was Caesar. Of course, he denied it was him, but the ensuing investigation caused the military to look closer at his file, and they quickly discovered that Ranger Caesar Baroni was none other than Jimmy Road. In October of 1990, Jimmy was discharged from the military effective immediately. By then, Kathy was in the final months of pregnancy with the couple's first child, and Caesar was unemployed. To make ends meet, he took a job in the Hillsboro area, which meant the couple would have to move. In March of 1991, just weeks after their son was born, Caesar left for Hillsboro to make arrangements for the move. Kathy stayed behind with their son and packed their belongings with the plan to join him in a month's time. On April 18th of 1991, the Hillsboro police responded to a call from a woman who had entered her friend's home and found her unresponsive. The 61-year-old woman was discovered lying naked on her bed with a pillow covering her face. Her legs were spread open and one foot hung limply over the edge of the bed. By the time the paramedics arrived, she was already cool to the touch. A detailed scene investigation got underway, but there was little evidence, just footprints leading away from the home and some unidentified hairs. One day later, on April 20th, Kathy and their son joined Caesar at their new home in Hillsboro. However, Jimmy's new job didn't work out so well, and he was once again on the job hunt. He had completed an EMT course in the military and he secured a job as a nursing assistant in a nursing home. From then on, he was going to be surrounded by elderly women every day. What could possibly go wrong? Well, first of all, despite his new job and Kathy's steady income, the couple never seemed to have enough money. Kathy wasn't a spender and Caesar always denied using their money, but he had started to disappear for days at a time or he was coming and going at odd hours, never having enough time for his wife and child. Kathy suspected that he was having an affair. That would be the understatement of the century, and by the time their son was one year old, she had had enough. The couple agreed to separate, and Caesar moved into a small apartment downstairs from a middle-aged woman who owned the home, Matilda. Caesar's newfound freedom enabled him to spend more time with a colleague he had met at the nursing home named Leonard Darcel, or Len, to his friends. Len lived on the ground floor of the home that Caesar had just moved into. In fact, he was the one who had organized with Matilda for Caesar to move in. Len had a criminal history of his own, including indecent exposure to a 16-year-old girl, theft, drug dealing, and petty crime. 
He was just the kind of friend Caesar needed to support the pursuit of his unique interests. All the while, Caesar continued to carry out a seemingly normal relationship with his ex and his child. He visited his son frequently and often picked him up directly from daycare. He attended family events at Kathy's mother's house, where he had once lived, and by all accounts, he was a dedicated and loving father. As it turns out, he was as dedicated to his extracurricular activities as he appeared to be to his family. Martha Bryant was a well-known midwife in the Hillsborough area. At 41 years old, she was in the prime of her career and was often called upon to help calm the nerves of a delivering mother or overworked colleague during a complex delivery. In the middle of the night on October 8, 1992, Martha left the birthing room at the Tuolity Community Hospital in Hillsboro after a late-night delivery. The birth had gone well, and Martha finished her paperwork in record time so she could clock out and head home to her husband. They were set to go on a long, overdue weekend away, and Martha couldn't wait to get home for some much-needed sleep before they left. As she drove the short distance to her home, she noticed the blinding lights of a tailgater right behind her. Out of nowhere, a bullet ripped through the passenger door of her Volkswagen Beetle. It was immediately followed by another shot, and then another, and another, until six shots had decimated her tiny car. But it wasn't her car she was worried about. A slug had ripped into her back before tearing through her lung, then a rib and finally exiting her body close to her armpit. Martha could no longer control the vehicle, and it veered across the road into the oncoming lane before mounting on the curb and finally stopping wedged across the sidewalk. Martha was in a state of panic when suddenly a man opened her door and looked down upon the wounded midwife, but this was no savior. The man dragged her from her car, down the road away from the scene of the crash. Finding a spot he liked, he attempted to rape her both orally and vaginally. Despite her wounded state, Martha literally fought tooth and nail to fend him off. She ripped her nails from their beds as she tore into the man, but it was to no avail. In the end, he realized he was not going to be able to have his way with her. She was too injured and almost unresponsive due to blood loss from the earlier wound. The man shot her point-blank through the temple with a twenty-two caliber gun. At 4 a.m., Martha was found lying in a pool of blood in the middle of the road where she had been left. Her left eye was protruding from its socket, and she had lacerations across her exposed body. A faint pulse was the only sign she was still alive. She was transported by helicopter to the closest hospital, but died just two hours later due to her injuries. Martha had never regained consciousness. While the investigation into the beloved midwife's brutal murder kicked into high gear, Caesar went about his life as usual. Just weeks before Martha's murder, he had left his nursing aid job, but didn't seem too worried about it. Friends didn't ask any questions about how he always seemed to be able to pay the bills despite not having a job. On the night before Christmas Eve 1992, just three months after Martha's murder, a 73-year-old resident of the care home where Caesar had once worked awoke to find a man staring down at her in bed. She was paralyzed from the waist down and couldn't fight the man off as he put his hand inside her nightgown and fondled her breast. He left as quickly as he had arrived, and while the woman couldn't identify the man, she knew she would never forget the unusual haircut that she had seen in the dark. Two days before New Year's Eve, Caesar and Len were returning from a night of drinking when they spotted a young woman waiting at a bus stop in the dark. They offered her a ride home, and she cautiously agreed. She was right to be cautious. As you can imagine, their intentions were anything but good, and after a short ride in the wrong direction, Caesar attempted to force the girl to perform oral sex on him while threatening her to be shot in the head if she denied him. Caesar had stolen a gun from his previous employer before he left the job and had taken to carrying it with him at all times. The girl eventually managed to break free from the men and ran off into the night. Caesar was not going to finish the year up unsatisfied, so the following night he and Len set off again in the hopes of making another pickup. They couldn't believe their luck when they spotted 23-year-old Shanty waiting for a bus as they drove past. The pair convinced her to come home with them for drinks, and after said drinks and some food, Shanty went off into the bedroom with Len. But Caesar didn't want to be left out, so he burst through the door while they were in the throes of passion and demanded Shanty pay him some physical attention. 
She agreed, but mostly because he had a gun in his hand. After finishing with Caesar, she asked to be taken home and Caesar and Len agreed to drive her. Later that day, Shanti was found discarded along the side of Sunset Highway. She had been violently beaten, but that was the least of her worries. She had also been shot execution style, point blank through the chin, sending the bullet on its destructive path up into her brain. Just one week after Shanti's murder, a 51-year-old woman was found by her son bent over the rim of her bathtub. One leg was wrapped up in the shower curtain, while on the other, her pants were bunched up around the ankle. This leg was dangling over the edge of the tub. Her face was submerged in a few inches of water, and she was very clearly dead. Nothing appeared to have been stolen from her home. Strangely, there was a 22 caliber gun found in her living room which her son didn't recognize. When the police arrived, they concluded that her death was a terrible accident, but just to be sure, they requested an autopsy on her remains. The woman's autopsy would later reveal she only had a few minor bruises on her body and a single laceration to her vagina. Given that her blood alcohol level was three times the legal driving limit, investigators believed she had likely slipped and fallen as she tried to take a shower. Her injuries were considered minor and required no further investigation as they were most likely caused by the woman's fall into the tub. Ultimately, her cause of death was determined to have been a heart attack. A month later, Kathy's mother was found dead on the floor of her home. Her clothing was still intact and there was no sign of violence or a break-in at the home, so her family decided there was no need for an autopsy. It was likely the woman had died from a heart attack despite her healthy and fit lifestyle. Suspicion may never have been raised about Kathy's mother's death had it not been for one mistake. Caesar had learned the PIN code for his mother-in-law's bank card and in the wake of her death, he withdrew more than $3,000 from her account. Kathy's brother had discovered the withdrawals and he knew that there was no one in his family who would possibly be so heartless as to steal from a dead woman. He immediately suspected Caesar and went straight to the police to file a report against him. While the police began looking into the bank withdrawals, Caesar made an unexpected visit to the upstairs owner of the apartment he had lived in when he first separated from Kathy. Just a few weeks earlier, Matilda had asked him to move out so she could move downstairs and occupy the apartment herself. Caesar knocked on her front door and told her he needed to use the bathroom to which she happily obliged. She had always liked Caesar. He had always been a helpful and reliable tenant. But the Caesar she met this time was not the same. When he returned from the bathroom, he lunged at Matilda, jamming a knife against her throat. He demanded she perform oral sex on him, and when she refused, he pressed the knife deeper into her skin. Fearing for her life, she agreed to do as he asked, but Caesar decided he had another idea. He told her to take all of her clothes off and lie down on the floor. He mounted Matilda, but was unable to rape her as he couldn't establish enough arousal. Matilda seized the opportunity to escape, and she told Caesar that a friend of hers was due to arrive at any moment, and he better get going. Caesar zipped up his jeans and left, giving her a parting glance of disgust. Once again, Caesar's hunger was unsatiated, and just 11 days after being unable to rape Matilda, he knocked on the door of an 83-year-old woman just after 8.30 p.m. He told her there had been a car accident and he needed to use her phone to call 911. She opened the door for him and he spun her around and grabbed her in a headlock before groping her breast. He'd chosen the wrong victim this time because this lady had spirit. She kicked Caesar in the shin and pressed a button on the personal alarm necklace she always wore. It let out an ear-splitting wail and also delivered a notification to local law enforcement. Moments after Caesar had entered the home, the police were on their way. By now, Caesar was increasingly frustrated at having missed his previous two opportunities for release, and he had begun to fear that his time as a free man was going to come to an end. There was no doubt that his former landlady would be able to identify him, and he figured she would most likely go to the police, so he began to live each day like it was his last. He was right to be worried. Three days after his attack on the 83-year-old woman, Caesar Baroni was arrested while he was drinking at a tavern with friends. As he had feared, he was charged on suspicion of rape, attempted sodomy, burglary, and menacing against Matilda. But internally, he breathed a sigh of relief. 
He knew he could talk his way out of those charges, and really, they were nothing compared to the other crimes he had committed. He had dodged a bullet, or so he had thought. It was only after he was facing charges for the attempted rape on Matilda that investigators began to draw a link between her assault and the other attacks on elderly women in the area. They secured a warrant to search his home and found, amongst other things, the knife they believed was used in some of the recent attacks and a 9mm gun and extra rounds of ammunition. With these items, they were able to further charge Caesar with the attack on the woman who had used her personal alarm to alert the police of her assault. Despite the best efforts of investigators, the truth of the matter is that it was actually a jailhouse informant that broke Caesar's case wide open. Troy Masters was serving time in the same jail as Caesar. He was a career criminal himself, having served time for theft, drugs, and burglary. Caesar was drawn to the big man, just as he had been to Ted Bundy. Troy seemed to have a position of authority in the jail, and Caesar took every opportunity to insert himself into the man's inner circle. He believed that the only way to join the man at the top was to prove he was every bit as tough and macho as the man himself. He began to reveal his crimes to Troy. Bit by bit, he painted himself as a cunning killer who had managed to escape suspicion for all these years. But Caesar didn't know that Troy was secretly disgusted by him. We've all seen enough TV to know inmates don't like pedophiles or child killers. Well, it turns out they don't like old lady killers either. Troy made contact with investigators, and he shared everything that Caesar had revealed to him about his crimes, going as far back as Alice, almost 15 years earlier. Over a period of weeks, he was able to glean unique identifying information from each of Caesar's crimes. Details that only the perpetrator would be privy to. With Troy's revelation, the pieces fell into place and the depths of Caesar's crimes were revealed. All the different police departments involved were able to bring together their separate pieces of the puzzle from the crimes committed in their neighborhoods. There were guns, vehicles, and accomplices. So many threads that had been tangled were unwound and the dots were finally connected. In 1994, Caesar Francesco Baroni was convicted of 14 charges from burglary to theft, attempted sodomy, and rape. For these crimes, he was sentenced to 44 years. In 1995, he was convicted of Martha's murder, for which he was sentenced to death. Later that same year, he was convicted of five counts of aggravated murder and three counts of felony murder and sentenced to 89 years. He also received two death sentences for the murders of Shanti and Margaret. All of Caesar's appeals to the Supreme Court were rejected, and in 2009, he died in prison from cancer. He was 49 years old. What's unique about Caesar's story is that unlike most notorious serial killers, he made no attempt to conceal his crimes. He didn't hide the bodies or clean up after himself to avoid detection. Fingerprints and later DNA were well-known investigative techniques at the time of his crimes, and yet he showed a complete disregard or concern for getting caught. Unlike Ted Bundy, who he proclaimed to have modeled his kills around, or the other notorious serial killers of our time, he wasn't particularly intelligent, deceptive, or indeed inventive in his M.O., and yet he managed to commit offense after offense relatively unobstructed. There was no crime unit put together to pursue the so-and-so killer, and for years, investigators didn't even realize that the killings and assaults were connected. Had it not been for his egotistical attempts to gain favor with another criminal, it's likely we would never have known the extent of his crimes. It's almost like he was basically a really mediocre serial killer, but that's exactly what he had to be to get away from his crimes for so long. Because of his death in prison, we will likely never know how many victims Caesar truly had, though it's suspected there are many more that he never revealed. It makes you wonder how many more people he killed, raped, or assaulted who never told a soul, for fear of the shame or perhaps thinking they wouldn't be believed just like his own stepmother, who only later revealed she had been raped by him. How many families thought their loved one had died by natural causes or due to an unfortunate accident when they had really met their end at the hands of a monster? If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. 
or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can also check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our new merch at Teespring. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.